Now in this video segment, I want to take some time to go over the geologic time scale. Now it would be impossible for us to make an exhaustive coverage of our geologic history in this video. So what I'm going to do is point out what I think are some key events in paleogeography, in historic biology, uh, just to give you a holistic feel for our geologic history. Um, anything above and beyond that, there's a whole lot of information, so feel free to take some time and look it up. Now, we'll start our discussion talking about the Precambrian Super Eon. Now, you'll notice I put Precambrian Eon up there, but that's a little bit wrong. It's actually a Super Eon, which contains three eons. It covers so much of geologic time, and yet we have such a poor record of it that uh, sometimes it's kind of lumped together. But I'll take a, take a couple of minutes to kind of point out some of the key differences in these three eons. Now, you'll notice the Super Eon goes from about 4.6 billion years ago, we're talking about the age of the Earth, the formation of the Earth, to 545 million years ago. That is the majority of all history on this planet. Now for a long time, uh, the planet was very hot, often molten, even at the surface. Uh, remember, a lot of the Earth's heat comes from radioactive decay in the core, and there was a lot more of that then. In fact, in the Hadean, uh, there had not been a, a total differentiation of layers in the Earth yet. Now we know that we have a molten, mainly iron core, and then we have our less dense materials at the surface, and there are different layers in and compositions of the core, the mantle, the asthenosphere, the lithosphere. Um, but at this time, things were a little closer to homogeneous and still working their way out. The dense stuff had not yet sunk to the center. Um, the oldest rock that we have dated is about 4.03 billion years old. Uh, the oldest mineral is in the Hadean as well, and it dates to about 4.406 billion years ago. Very close to the oldest age that exists for this Earth. Zircon, I can tell you, is a very tough mineral. In fact, it is one of the most preferential minerals to use for radioactive dating methods. Now, in the Hadean, there is some indirect photosynthetic evidence of primordial life. That means even as far back as 3.8 billion years ago, we find evidence of kerogen, which is created by organic decay. So uh, this puts life a lot older than we used to think not very long ago that it was. Uh, some of the textbooks are not even updated for some of the ages of these discoveries. Now, next we have the Archaean, and the Archaean goes back about 3.8 billion years to about 2.5 billion years ago. Uh, in this time, the main cratons that exist now probably began to stabilize near the end of the Archean. Uh, that's things like the, uh, the uh, North Canadian Shield. And uh, we find our first stromatolite evidence here in the Archean. In the Middle Archean, about 3.2 billion years ago, there are these structures built probably by colonial cyanobacteria. We see stromatolites formed even today. And so this is fossil evidence of life as far back as the Middle Archaean. And at the end of this, we even see some orogeny events. There is some mountain building going on. And then we go on to the Proterozoic Eon. It was named originally Proterozoic because they thought that that was where the first evidence of primordial life was to be found. However, you've seen that subsequently we've kind of updated that. Now, the Proterozoic goes from about two and a half billion years ago. And I don't want it to be lost on people how many years a billion really is uh, to 545 million years ago. Here we find protists, we find green algae, and at the end of it, we find one of the most famous fossil discoveries ever, the Ediacaran biota, or the Ediacaran fauna, named for the Ediacara hills in Australia. Now, it's also during the Proterozoic that the atmosphere becomes significantly oxygenic because there is evidence of oxygen-producing bacteria as far back as the Archaean. And by this time, because remember, 
this is a lot of time passing, much more in these periods than what we'll lump together later on, that oxygen producing bacteria begins to change the atmosphere. And so what happens is anaerobic life, of which there was a lot, pretty much dies out. Now you know we have some anaerobic organisms here on Earth now that thrive in anaerobic situations and swamps and deep marine environments, but there's not a lot of it. This is when life turned preferentially to oxygen-loving aerobic systems, and um, that was during the proto Now the first complex single-celled protists are about 1.8 billion years ago, and the first trace fossils of eukaryotic life, and this is, this is in dispute, but this is what they think. Uh, there's very little consensus about this kind of thing. Um, but those first trace fossils of eukaryotic, complex, multicellular, nucleotic cell type life are about a billion years old. Now in this time, in the Proterozoic, we're looking at Rodinia. Now Rodinia actually formed about 1.1 or 1.2 billion years ago. It's the very first supercontinent and lasted till about 750 million years ago. So it's completely contained within the Proterozoic Eon and it, like I said, is the very first supercontinent that we know about. Um, later on we see really, really beautiful fossils uh, in the Ediacaran biota named for the Ediacara Hills in Australia and about 600 million years ago. So about 150 million years after Rodinia breaks up, those pieces reform another supercontinent called Panatea. And that supercontinent actually forms around the South Pole and because of that orientation of the supercontinent, this is the age we believe to be the most prolific in glaciation of all the geologic ages. Um, and that, like I said, is just mostly due to the orientation of all the land. So we see a lot of history of glaciation that takes place on Panatea. And another thing that defines the Proterozoic are these passive margin assemblages that we know about. It's shale, carbonate, sandstone. And these assemblages indicate real tectonic activity. And uh, so that's why it's another interesting, definitive kind of thing that takes place. And one last uh, thing that we start to see here is because the atmosphere has become significantly oxygenic, we now see that iron can be oxidized, and that equates into rusting. So we see the first banded iron formations, or BIFs. And these represent cycles of a lot of available oxygen, which is taken in by the iron and it precipitates out of the water and rusts, as it were. And then there is a band where it doesn't, which represents a cycle of not very much available oxygen and back and forth. So we start to see this uh, recording of what's going on because, of course, these bands record the movement of tectonic plates, uh, among other things. And now we will move our discussion on to the next interesting geologic period. This is where things start to get really active. We're going to move to the Phanerozoic Eon, which covers all of time from about 545 million years ago until now. And the first era in that eon is the Paleozoic Era, which covers about 545 million years ago to about 251 million years ago. And there are periods in that era that we want to talk about, the first being the Cambrian period, 545 million years ago to 488 million years ago. And it is in the Cambrian that we see what we call the Cambrian explosion, a quick, relatively, ge geologically speaking, diversification of life on Earth like has never been seen before. And this is best represented by the Burgess Shale, which is a relic of the Cambrian period and shows a diverse and strange assemblage of life in that time. During the Cambrian, most modern phyla appear, um, a lot of extinct things as well. Panatea breaks up and Gondwana emerges, which is something we'll talk about because it's paleogeographically significant. It's kind of the southern chunk of Panatea that breaks off. and um, at this time, actually, the atmospheric CO2 
is 20 to 35 times greater than that of today. Now think about that in terms of global warming. Today we have about 385 parts per million volume of CO2 in the atmosphere. At this time, there is 7,700 to 13,475 parts per million volume. So uh, it gives you something to think about.